everybody. I think we'll start. Good evening and welcome to the third talk um, in this Wednesday of the Genome Public Lecture Series. Um, given the fact that it is the third talk, I guess you all know about having Q&A session at the end and cookies outside, so I'll skip all these logistics and I'll uh, go directly to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Celeste Berg. Um, Celeste did her undergrad at University of California, Santa Cruz in, in chemistry, uh, a PhD in Yale University in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, and then a postdoc in Carnegie Institute of Washington in developmental genetics. Uh, and she's now a professor at genome sciences here at UW. Um, Celeste Lab is interested in developmental genetics and genomics, which means that she's trying to understand how the genomes of different organisms, and focusing primarily on fruit fly as a model organism, is helping to regulate the formation of patterns and shape during organ organismal development. But uh, in this case, this is not really relevant to what she'll talk about today, because today she'll talk about a completely different passion of her, which is how do we use genetics and genomics for forensic sciences. Uh, and to be completely honest, I'm not really sure what is the origins of Celeste's fascination with forensics. I can only imagine. Uh, and I'm hoping she'll tell us about it. Um, this could be at least partly due to a class that Celeste and another faculty in the department, Dr. Bonnie Brewer, uh, taught for the past uh, um, uh, years um, uh, that is called CSI Seattle, where they were trying to not only tell the students about how do you use genomics and genetics for forensic sciences, but actually to demonstrate that, uh, which obviously made the course extremely popular, but also very concerning, especially if you didn't know about this and you went up to the second floor and you found a grad student on the floor uh, covered in fake blood and trying not to move. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping to tell us a lot about this. The one last thing I want to tell you about Celeste, specifically if you're not from the Department of Genome Sciences, if you are, you already know that. Uh, but if you're not, you should know that Celeste is by far the most persistent questioner that I know. Um, I think over the past um, nine or 10 years, I've attended probably hundreds of talks with Celeste from grad students, from postdocs, from uh, colleagues, from visitors. And I could not remember a single talk where Celeste didn't have a question at the end of the talk, and she's usually the first person that raises her hand uh, with some question. And I'm telling you that for two reasons. First of all, I think it's a great testament not to the fact that Celeste tends to not understand talks, um, <laughs> but, but rather <laughs> that she's extremely curious and, and has extremely broad interest, which I think is a, is a wonderful quality uh, for a scientist. Um, the second reason is because I think you should all learn from that and ask lots of questions at the end of every talk, including specifically this one. And I'm sure Celeste will enjoy being on the other side of this question. And so uh, with that, please just help me to welcome Celeste to the podium. I see my comrade in arms is in the audience, Bonnie. Imagine a cold, dark November night in 1982, and you are chief of detectives for the Seattle Police Department. A call comes in. A child has been found in a cardboard box behind a TV repair shop in Magnolia. Your initial investigations show she was sexually assaulted and then strangled with a tie from a bathrobe. And you learn that her name is Crispin Sunset and she was only 13 years old. What would you do to investigate the crime? I want to know, what would you do? Tell me. Bonnie, what would you do? What kind of samples? Okay. Rape kit. That would be a possibility. What else would you do? Fingernails. Fingernails. Okay. Why would you want fingernails? That is great, but keep in mind this is 1982. This was prior to any DNA analyses. What else could you go after? Fingerprints. Back of the room? 
footprints. Other ideas? Possibly blood. Heather. Lots of photos. Great. I love being short and having these boards. <laughs> Other ideas. Well, how would you do that? So how would you identify what robe was missing the belt? How would you do that? Okay, the brand of robe. That's a good idea. Where sold. All right. And who, well, yeah, okay. This is Seattle. <laughs> that might be tough. Okay. Excellent. Talk to family and others in the area. Family. Friends. Can't write. Neighbors even. Maybe somebody saw something. Other ideas. Check her home. Absolutely. All right, I ran out of space. At least no one suggested a psychic. <laughs> All right, so I came up with a few ideas. You came up with many more good ones. And I can tell you right now that the police followed up on all those leads, all of these leads. And unfortunately, the, that evidence let them eliminate over a dozen people as possible suspects, but they were unable to obtain sufficient evidence to arrest anyone. And as a result, the case went cold. About 10 years later, the, department, the police department put together a cold case team and they reevaluated the evidence in part because a paper had come out in 1993, uh, sorry, in the middle 1980s by uh, Alec Jeffries in Great Britain proposing a method for analyzing DNA called DNA fingerprinting. And that method had been used to solve crimes in England. So the investigators were hopeful that they could apply similar techniques here. Unfortunately, when they looked at the samples that they had, there was insufficient DNA to use this older method. And again, the case went cold. Ten years later, another cold case team reevaluated the evidence and took advantage of another new method that had been developed by Carrie Mullis. And I'll talk more about this later in the talk. This method let investigators actually increase or amplify the DNA available to them. And they were hopeful then that they might be able to use this new method on the samples. Sure enough, the forensic scientists were able to get really high quality DNA. But when they submitted their samples to the FBI's database, a database that includes information only from convicted criminals, they did not find a match in the database. Nevertheless, the police department was really hopeful. They had DNA evidence. This was really good. What they needed was to find who that DNA matched to. So they went back to all the records they had, kept evaluating things, and over and over again, one particular name kept popping up. And that was that of John Athan, who at that time was a 14-year-old neighbor boy. He had been seen pushing a rather large cardboard box down the hill. And when questioned about it, he claimed that he had been stealing firewood from someone. And that's what was in the box, not the body of Kristen. At that time, John was already a 37-year-old adult living in New Jersey, and the Seattle Police Department did not have the money to go to New Jersey to try to get a DNA sample. 
So the police came up with a very, very clever ruse. They pretended they were lawyers. And they created a false lawsuit against the city of Seattle, claiming that the C Seattle uh, city offices had overcharged on parking fines. So they uh, sent this class action lawsuit to John, knowing that he had lived in Seattle and had parking tickets during the relevant time period. Now, a key to this effort of the police department, they actually used their real names as the title of the law firm and indeed used the correct address for the Seattle Police Department. <laughs> yes, indeed. John, thinking, oh, class action lawsuit, easy money, fell for it, filled out the papers, stuffed them in an envelope, licked the seal of the envelope and sent it back to Seattle. And there, Dr. Bev Hemick, head of the Washington State Crime Lab, was able to obtain sufficient DNA from the back of that envelope to match to the crime scene. John Athan was convicted and sent to prison, but his lawyer appealed saying, this was entrapment. You can't do this. The case went all the way to the Washington State Supreme Court where the court determined in favor of the state, arguing that the police often used ruses in prostitution cases or drug cases. And indeed, they used their own names and their own address and even a little bit of homework by Jonathan Athan would have revealed this ruse. As a result, 25 years after Crispin's death, John Athan, the killer, knew he was caught. So today what I'd like to do is share with you some of the history I've learned about forensics from teaching this cool class with Bonnie and the impact that the, these new methods have had by telling you about some key cases that have occurred over the years. I'll tell you about the methods that are used mainly in the field and I'll end by talking about one case in the news recently that uses a somewhat different method and has been highly controversial for ethical reasons. In the course of my talk tonight, I hope I convince you that not only is DNA good for catching the bad guys, but it also helps clear the good guys and identify victims. And as El Hanan said, if you have questions, please just interrupt. Please stop and ask. So I'll start with the history and impact. Let's step back a little bit and think about what are the methods that the police use to uh, investigate crimes. First and foremost, they get eyewitness accounts. They ask the victims. They get personal statements. And when it's available, they use physical evidence, such as fingerprints, blood, hair, clothing, fiber, weapons, you mentioned these, okay? So I'll go through a few cases starting with personal accounts to give you an example of how sometimes these efforts work and sometimes they don't. The first example you can learn more about by tuning into a 60 minutes uh, television program on CBS that talks about Jennifer Thompson who back in 2000, sorry, back in 1984 was a 22-year-old college student living in Burlington, North Carolina. This is her apartment. You probably can't see it very well. It was a hot, humid July night when she awoke to an intruder. She was really scared, but she had her wits about her and she told the intruder, take my money, my car, my credit cards, anything. But that's not what the intruder came for. And during the sexual assault, Jennifer vowed if she survived, she would remember everything about this man, his voice, his eyes, his hair, everything. 
About a half an hour later, she was able to trick that rapist and convince him that she could fix him a drink out in the kitchen, and she escaped running out the back door. He left and then went down the street and found another victim. Jennifer went to the police and with the aid of a sketch artist developed a composite sketch that went out and brought it, that was sent out and brought in lots of tips. And through the tips, the detectives were able to put together what they call a six pack, several suspects, and they showed them to Jennifer. She studied these pictures and she decided that this individual, Ronald Cotton, was the man. The police brought him in for questioning and he confused the weekends and gave what the police thought was a false alibi and thought he was lying. They put him in a lineup and again, Jennifer said, he's the man. And in his trial, it was mainly her testimony that convicted him and he was sent to prison. But in prison, an unusual thing happened. While Ronald Cotton was there, another person was incarcerated at the same prison, a man named Bobby Poole. And he looked so much like Ronald Cotton that the staff there would call them each other's names. Another inmate overheard Bobby Poole admit to having carried out both rapes that night. And with that evidence, Ron Cotton went to his lawyer and was able to secure another trial. Once again, Jennifer's testimony, when confronted with both men in the courtroom, she picked Ron Cotton and he was again convicted. 10 years after the assault, 10 years later, he, he had spent in jail he and the rest of the world listened avidly to another famous trial, that of A.J. Simpson. And at that trial, the investigators presented what was then a rather new technique, DNA evidence. Ron Cotton thought that if he could get DNA evidence from the rape kit from that night, it would prove he was not the person. His lawyer warned him, look, if it comes back and you're the guy, this is it. And he said, go for it. And they did. And the rape kit came back. And it proved conclusively that it was Bobby Poole who had done both rapes that night. Jennifer was devastated, absolutely shattered when she found out. She couldn't sleep. She just it was horrible, and she eventually asked to meet with Ron Cotton, and they met at a church, and she told him of her shame, and Ron Cotton did the unthinkable. He forgave her, and the two of them have become fast friends. They actually tour the country and talk to district attorneys and police officers about the improper ways of showing photos or lineups to witnesses. And they've changed the laws in many states as a result. One thing you should be able to see from this story though, as tragic as it is, is that DNA analysis can exclude or exonerate a suspect. And indeed, the Innocence Project has been working for the last 25 years to attempt to use DNA analyses to free people who claim they're innocent. And so far, they've freed 358 people, including 28 from death row. Yeah, whoa. Over three quarters of those people that were convicted were convicted based largely on eyewitness testimony. So eyewitness testimony, You'd think it's powerful, but there are problems with our memories. Um, physical evidence can be more concrete, and we'll see how it can be good or bad to you. We'll do two case studies, one on fingerprints and then some on blood.
In 2008, Janai Coleman was killed during a carjacking near Atlanta. Surveillance footage and DNA on a cigarette left at the scene suggested that Donald Smith was the culprit. But Donald Smith offered a really unusual defense. He claimed it was his twin who did it. Donald has an identical twin named Ronald. And sure enough, when the police took Ronald's DNA and compared it to Donald's DNA, they matched. Now I'll come back to this kind of data later on in the talk and explain to you exactly what it is you're looking at. But you should be able to see just by comparing the two lines that they're pretty similar to each other. You don't need to be an expert to see they look similar. The DNA profiles match. But what doesn't match are their fingerprints. Identical twins have different fingerprints. And it turned out that it, indeed it was Ronald who had done the carjacking and not Donald. And this case helped support a 1903 case involving two men who were incredibly similar, having different fingerprints and convincing uh, the FBI and other police bodies that fingerprints are useful tools for distinguishing individuals. Well, police departments, sheriffs, FBI, they've had over 100 years to use fingerprints to their advantage. But criminals have had over 100 years to figure out that fingerprints could be bad. And so they've quickly learned that you could put on a glove or wipe surfaces and escape the use of fingerprint detection methods. There are other problems with fingerprints. They have been misclassified, but overall, usually fingerprints are quite damning. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at an example where blood typing was important. Um, this is a case that's been in the news recently. Um, Mickey and Joe Bryan are both teachers, and while Joe was away at a principal's conference, his wife was shot down, gunned down, and murdered in their bedroom at home. The police were given some evidence out of the trunk of Joe Bryan's car, a flashlight that appeared to have blood splatters on the surface of it due to some unfortunately weak forensic analysis uh, the forensic specialist convinced a jury that the blood splatters on that flashlight were consistent with Joe holding the flashlight in one hand and the gun in the other and killing his wife. The blood on the flashlight was type O blood. Now there were a number of problems with the analysis of the blood splatters but one really important issue you should realize is that the type O blood on the flashlight could have come from 45% of the world's population. If all you're looking at is blood type, it's not giving you much information. It's far too broad to be conclusive. You need other methods. You'll probably hear more about this case in the news. Um, they're reopening the trial and reinvestigating some of the efforts. Okay. The main point is that blood typing alone is not sufficient for, for um, analyses. On the other hand, blood typing can be used to ex exclude the innocent. And in a really famous case in the 1940s, the actress Joan Barry accused Charlie Chaplin of being the father of her daughter, Carol Ann. Joan Barry has blood type A, and her daughter has blood type B. Now, you might ask yourself, how is it that somebody with blood type A can have a child with blood type B? And what you need to know is that each of us has two copies of the gene that determines blood type. 
We got one copy from mom and one copy from dad. And what must be going on in this case is that Joan has one copy of the A version of a gene, and that's what's giving her the A blood type. But her other copy is a silent version, what we call a recessive allele, and it's that silent version that she passed on to her daughter, Carol Ann. The B blood type must be coming from her father. That makes sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. So she's got the re silent version from mom and the B version from dad. But Charlie Chaplin is type O blood, and all type O individuals have the two silent or recessive versions. Four medical doctors did blood tests on these individuals, and all four of them agreed that Charlie Chaplin cannot be the dad. At that time, however, the laws in California excluded the use of blood tests in a courtroom. And as a result, Chaplin was taken to court twice. The first trial deadlocked, and the second, the jury found 11 to 1 that Charlie was the father. As a result of this brouhaha, the state of California and many other states changed their paternity testing laws and now allow blood testing in courts. But what you see is that as a result of this, quote, novel technology of blood testing, misunderstandings and wrong results can occur. There was another really famous test where technology was not understood very well, and that is in the case of the O.J. Simpson trial. O.J. Simpson was accused of murdering his estranged wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ronald Goldman, in a brutal attack, multiple stab wounds. The blood and DNA evidence truly suggested that O.J. Simpson was the culprit but the jury found him not guilty. There are probably a lot of reasons for that, some of which was that the jury just didn't understand the DNA evidence. Some of it, too, is the fact that O.J. Simpson was a famous football player. His race played into it. He had some really smart lawyers who claimed that a police officer had framed O.J. Simpson by contaminating the samples with O.J.'s blood. As a result, O.J. was acquitted. But probably also the jury suffered through many hours looking at old-style DNA fingerprinting evidence, not really understanding what they were looking at. And therefore, it's important for everyone to try to learn about these technologies because you might be on a jury someday yourself, and it's good if you know how it works. So we've talked about how personal accounts can have a huge impact, really convince juries. We've talked about physical evidence, how it has pros and cons. Let's take a look now at why I'm arguing that DNA analysis is so much better. And there's really several reasons. The first is that the analyses are pretty definitive. All of us in this room are almost identical to each other, 99.9% .9 if we look at our DNA. But when you look at the 3 billion base pairs, that 0.1% is enough. All of us have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad, and we were, if we look at that DNA from a chromosome, we'd see the A's, T's, D's, and C's that make up our DNA sequence. If we were to compare a sequence between individuals, what all of us do is start with the reference genome from the human genome. The human genome sequence, uh, was developed and sequenced 
in part through the leadership of Bob Waterston, our chair. We now have a really, really good reference genome. If you compare the reference genome to sequences from other individuals, you'll see different types of, of changes between these people and the reference genome. There are many other types of changes, but for tonight's talk, the two that matter are differences in the lengths or the numbers of these repeats, these short tandem repeats, in this case, CACA. The other type of difference that I'll talk about at the end of the talk are these single nucleotide differences. And they will come to play in that very last case I'll tell you about. So the methods for analyzing DNA are quite good. And when you see the sequence, it's definitive. Another reason that DNA is so good is that it's pretty stable. Investigators were able to show that bones found in the Ekaterinburg forest of Russia did indeed belong to the Romanov family, the Russian czars who had been murdered during the Bolshevik Revolution of 1918. In fact, we heard last week that DNA is so stable that it's possible to isolate DNA from bones of 30,000-year-old relatives of ours, the Neanderthals. Okay. So DNA is stable. The other feature is that the methods used for analyzing the DNA are really sensitive. A single cell, a single cell, skin cell, a sperm cell, a hair cell is sufficient to provide the evidence to convict somebody. So now, before we talk about those methods, let me just point out that DNA analyses is an perfect in every respect. And another case study will help to illustrate that. Annie Lay was a graduate student at Yale. And a few days before her planned wedding, she disappeared. Her body was discovered a few days later in the basement laboratory of the Yale School of Medicine. The police were able to use information, surveillance cameras around these animal labs, the fact that you needed a card key to access the building like we do in Fagy, um, and DNA analysis to show that Ro Roger Clark was uh, the killer. He was a lab tech and he was convicted. But the analysis wasn't quite so easy. It turned out that Annie's clothing, including the waistband of her underwear, had DNA from two men. One of those men was the killer. The other was not her fiance. As it turned out, the other was a construction worker. The man who had actually built the wall Behind, whose, uh, behind which the lab tech had stuffed Annie to hide her. He had spent one whole summer, hot, humid, New Haven, sweating, building this wall. And he'd probably taken his shirt off and the skin cells had rubbed off on the wood. And they were stable. And when Clark stuffed Annie's body behind the wall, it rubbed up against the wood, and some of those cells were transferred. And the assays were sensitive enough to detect the DNA from both men. Fortunately, or unfortunately for the men, question. Ah, was that construction worker so happened to be in the database? Excellent question. Yes, it was. He had been convicted of a crime previously. You're absolutely right. And in that way, they were able to track him down and find out that he had died two years previously. <laughs> and as a result, he couldn't possibly be the person who had killed Annie. If he hadn't been in the database or hadn't died, he would be a suspect. Great. So DNA analysis sometimes has its problems. 
All right. Let's take a look at the actual methods and see how they work. So I told you that investigators use these short tandem repeats, and most of the most of the regions that they look at have these four base repeats. In this case, it's G A C G, the repeated sequence, and N is the number of repeats. FBI and other forensic specialists look at 20 different loci across the whole genome. Initially, they looked at 13, but they've added seven more sites in part to be able to compare DNA from U.S. databases with European and other countries' databases. So now everyone uses these 20. What do the data look like? Well, what we're looking at here are three different regions of the genome, D3, S1358, from the third chromosome, VWA, and FGA. And for each region, you're looking at two peaks of DNA that are slightly different from each other because those sequences have different numbers of repeats. One of the DNA samples came from mom and the other from dad, and that's true. They're slightly different in all of these sites. If we look at another individual, we see this individual has different numbers of repeats. And the, this individual matches the evidence from the crime scene, but those are different from the first suspect. So if we look at just these three sites, we see that suspect one has 14 or 15 repeats, 17 or 18, 23 or 24, but suspect two in the evidence have 15 and 18 repeats, 17 and 19 are 23 and a half repeats and 24. All right, so that's a match from these three. It looks like these are similar. This is clearly different. But scientists use 20 loci. Why would you want to use so many loci for the identification? Why would you want to do that? Specificity, what'd you say? Consistency. Consistency. What do you mean by specificity? Yes, there's a lot of people who might have those three combinations of repeat numbers, but very few who would have all 20. So let's take a look at this. Let's imagine we have a crime scene and we have two suspects, Jerry Seinfeld and O.J. Simpson, and by chance, both of them have the same number of repeats as the crime scene DNA. Now, the frequency of different repeat numbers varies in different ethnic groups, but that's known amongst populations. But by chance, you might imagine well, you'd match 10% you know, of the time. But if you were to look at all of these loci and all of them matched like O.J. Simpson's DNA did to the crime scene sample, the probability or the chance of that happening is one in four quadrillion. It's more than the number of people on Earth. And so that's why investigators look at many loci. All right, so how do we obtain sufficient DNA to analyze all these loci? I told you that a single cell could provide the evidence, but there's only two chromosomes from uh, two copies of each chromosome in that cell. How do you get enough DNA to analyze all these different sites and be confident of the number of repeats that you have? Well, here is where that new technique comes in, the one that was developed by Carrie Mullis. To identify these tandem repeat alleles, we use a method called PCR, a polymerase chain reaction, to make copies specifically of these DNA regions. We isolate DNA from blood or samples from the crime scene, and then we essentially use a molecular photocopier to make copies just of the regions of interest. So you can imagine that the, uh, what we're doing is taking a book that contains a quote, and we want to make copies of this quote 
we mark it with post-it notes and then we Xerox just the region uh, bracketed by the post-it notes. The comparison is that the book that contains the quote is the genomic DNA from the sample. The post-it notes are what we call primers, pieces of DNA that match all individuals, cons highly conserved regions, but bracket the area that's highly variable, the repeat regions. The nucleotides are the raw materials like paper and ink, and DNA polymerase is the enzyme that actually does the Xeroxing. This method was developed by Kerry Mullis, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1993 because this invention has truly revolutionized molecular biology. All of us use PCR. It's really changed the way we do science. It's amazing. So what I'm going to do is show you how the reactions work, and then I'll show you a quick video. You start with all these different components, and the first thing you do is to denature the DNA by heating it up, and that separates the two strands. You then cool things down a little bit, giving a chance for the post-it notes to find the sites where they can bind. You then heat it up to the temperature that that enzyme really prefers, and it uses the nucleotides to create new DNA. And then you repeat the cycle over and over. Everything is in excess, and by 25 or 30 repeats, you've made billions of copies from a single piece of DNA. The reason this works is the enzyme that we all use comes from the hot springs at Yellowstone, and it can stand these vast changes in temperature. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. The primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, the enzyme TAC polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the prime sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. So it's this method that makes PCR so powerful and DNA analysis so good. Now, DNA analysis is generally accepted. In fact, when Bill Clinton was accused of having an affair with his intern, Monica Lewinsky, back in the late 1990s, he originally denied it until he learned that the FBI had evidence from a stained dress belonging to Monica, and he quickly changed his story. So we've learned about these methods. Now I'd like to go back and do one more case study a case study that's had a huge impact here in Seattle. Between 1980 and 1990, many young women, mostly prostitutes and runaways, disappeared, and their bodies were found naked in the forest, assaulted and strangled. The first four victims were discovered near, near the Green River, near Mount Rainier. And so the serial killer was dubbed the Green River Killer. Since then, he would transport the bodies all over, 
Kent, Auburn, SeaTac, Issaquah, Enumclaw, even down to Portland to try to confuse the police. Although uh, the, the police uh, had some suspects, they didn't have the evidence until 2001 when Dave Reichert, the sheriff in charge of the investigation, called together his team and asked them to reevaluate the cold case data and see if there was DNA for evaluation. And once again, Bev Himmick came to the rescue. They scrubbed fingernails. They actually found semen and pubic hairs. They really tried hard to find as much as they could. And they were able to obtain DNA from four of the bodies. The DNA from all four matched. There were three other bodies that had unusual paint specks on them, and that linked them to Gary Ridgway, whose DNA they had found, and he was a paint sprayer at the Kenworth Truck Factory. So when the police arrested Gary Ridgway, they indicted him or accused him of seven murders. In the end, however, to avoid the death penalty, he confessed to 48 crimes, and he brought the police to many of the bodies of his victims. Gary Ridgway is called by the police the most prolific serial killer, and he stated in his confession that I killed so many I can't keep them all straight. He's now serving 48 life sentences with no possibility of parole. And he's often stated that he thinks he's killed as many as 80 or 90 women. Yeah. DNA got, put him away. All right, now let's look at one last case study. I'll try to do this quickly because we're running out of time. And this is something also that's been in the news quite a bit lately. Another serial killer, the Golden State Killer, had eluded the police for 40 years. It was an unusual case where there seemed to be different MOs, burglaries in one area, rapes in another, homicides in another, and different profiles or sketches were developed. But eventually, DNA from a rape case was matched to DNA from a homicide case, and the police began to suspect it was one person doing all these things. They also suspected that the, this Golden State killer knew something about police techniques. He would spy on his victims and choose the only those who had good escape routes, like a bike trail or a park, they could get away. In the end, Paul Holes wanted to try to catch this guy before he retired. And he thought, well, we're not finding anything in the CODIS database. I'm going to try a different technique. I'm going to try a technique that's not limited just to convicted criminals. I'll take advantage of the DNA databases that are out there where people voluntarily upload their DNA for Ancestry.com or 23andMe and try to find their relatives. And so that's what he did. He took DNA that they had obtained from a rape kit and um, analyzed it using the same methods that are used for these ancestry sites, using these polymorphisms in the genome. Uploaded it to a database that allowed police investigators to access the data. Ancestry.com and 23andMe do not allow police um, use of their site. But the GED match site found uh, something like 10 or 20 distant relatives, and a team of five investigators spent four months looking up birth records, marriages, deaths, and so forth, and they built 25 family trees one of which eventually had a link of a second cousin to a retired policeman, shown here. They then learned that he lived in the Sacramento area and started following him. 
They obtained DNA from a car handle just after he had driven it and uh, isolated DNA. They also went back several days later and obtained tissue from the trash outside of his house. Both of those samples matched and matched the crime scene. And the police arrested him. He is now in custody. So th this trial was quite, or sorry, this case is quite cr controversial because the police are using DNA that people did not expect to be used for criminal analyses. And so it's created quite an ethical issue. So what I've told you today is about the history and impact of DNA forensics, some of the methods that are used, and the likely direction of future investigations. And I hope I've convinced you that DNA can be used to catch the bad guys and clear the good guys and identify victims. I want to thank Bonnie, who's an awesome colleague and who helped me set up the CSI class that we taught so many years, Anne and Rachel and Mark for help with my practice talks and any questions. Thank you. Thank you.